the fact that we've not had a real correction does that worry you people must enter the market at some point of time maybe in staggered manner can equity still deliver returns better than most other asset classes over any medium to longer term time frame from current mm-hmm. levels i think so but if they are looking at the returns that they saw last year and want <laughs> that to continue i think that is where you are essentially going to uh, see a lot of disappointment equity has to be there in your portfolio mm-hmm. when you think about the great california gold rush Uh, you know, a lot of people flock to California to to look for gold. They look for gold. The only guys who ended up making money are the guys who sold shovels to them. Hello and welcome to Market Cafe. I'm your host Surabhi Upadhyay. The markets have been on a roll, and retail investors, you and I, we are in the driver's seat. We have the steering wheel in our hand, and we're navigating this market's journey. Now, this got me thinking. how do some of the biggest fund managers of this country look at the present situation how are they managing all of these big flows that are coming into mutual funds and are they feeling as confident about the future well i decided to catch up with well the biggest of them all this is a fund house which is managing 9 lakh crore rupees in total assets under management so i'm sure the men over here men and women over here they know a thing or two about uh, the stock market let me go and introduce you to two of them Mr DP Singh the joint CEO and deputy MD of SBI mutual fund and Dinesh Balachandran the head of equity lots to talk about let's get to it Well, uh, DP sir and Bala, thank you so much for uh, coming here. I feel great. I've finally managed to sit them down. You know, the men from SBI Mutual Fund for a conversation here on Market Cafe. Really appreciate uh, both of you for taking out the time, especially some of your fund managers, sir. Because at least we see you off and on. You know, these guys are absolute uh, sort of you know media recluses, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> no, sometimes it's better to just do your work. I've uh, <laughs> been busy in their work, day yeah. in and day out. Yeah. Okay, okay. So you make them work hard, huh? I guess. <laughs> for the end investor so since uh, a lot of people might might not be sort of knowing uh, the two of you i want to start with a bit of an introduction now mr singh of course has been with the mutual fund world for for over 30 years now 25 yeah? years 25 25 years yeah. and you you've been a sbi man through and through the yes. bank and and then yes. the fund journey tell us a little bit about it about you know how how have you managed to stick it out what uh, what still inspires you every day No, see, look, 25 years. It's mm. amazing, amazing journey. When when I joined a mutual fund as a deputy from SBI, mm. our area was uh, just 2,300 crores. 2,300 crores. Way back in uh, 98, right? Okay. So today we are sitting on 9 lakh 22,000 crores. Big daddies so of the Indian mutual fund world, right? Yeah. Largest. So so that gives a lot of satisfaction yeah. that the journey mm-hmm. has been extremely, extremely good, very, very good journey and. the kind of trust which we have been able to generate amongst the investor and the mm-hmm. we have walked the talk whatever we have been talking about so so mm-hmm. that gives a a lot of satisfaction but this has been a journey I mean i am like a straight banker i have been in the cadre joined the fund house as a branch head in chandigarh and oh. uh, and uh, then move to regional head zone or head national head zone and so forth uh-huh. it's like a journey in any other public sector oh, lovely lovely there. absolutely oh, you yeah. know glorious many many Uh, years and decades over here now uh, bala tell us a little more about yourself because you've been with the uh, sbi mutual fund for i think over a decade as well right but you're a techie who went to iit and mit yeah. the massachusetts institute of technology and you find yourself in financial services so what's a techie doing in financial services for yeah. so long yeah you know it's <laughs> funny a lot of my um uh, you know fellow batchmates from iit uh-huh. they complain that i moved over to the dark side yeah <laughs> So frankly speaking when I was doing my studies I had no idea that I was going to get into the financial services domain. So um so at IIT um it was all about sort of doing basic research trying to do something on the technology side. Mhm. And that's what made me go to MIT as well. So what I was What did you study at MIT? So material science where uh, actually I was doing work on these uh, advanced battery systems and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh stuff that now is like all the buzz with the EVs and and, yeah. and stuff like that yeah. right. So um So I was actually on my way to, uh, towards uh, getting a PhD. Now the nice thing about MIT is it allows you to take classes across various departments. Mm-hmm. So it's like completely open. Yeah. You yeah. go into any class, you can just sit in and and just listen, right? So I just happened to sit in on this class, investing class at MIT Sloan, hmm. uh, where they were talking about investing with the various types of investing and stuff like that. 
and that somehow got me hooked uh, because Imagine. when i think about investing mm. it feels like a puzzle mm. it is one where you are essentially trying to solve a puzzle on a regular basis uh, you never really get the answer because the market keeps sort of confusing you from asking you but it's like a challenge that you want to embrace right mm -hmm. now research also is very exciting uh, when i say research i mean uh, the tech research mm -hmm. or uh, the stuff that i was doing otherwise but the problem there is that the feedback loop tends mm. to be very long mm. you are working on a research project for multiple years mm. and you have no idea whether you're on the right track or not <laughs> in markets you get a scorecard uh, yeah. every day it's either delay. a slap in your yeah, face yeah. or you know standing ovation yeah. so 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 that actually appeared to me as a as a greater challenge uh -huh. Uh, and and so I just sort of took a complete. And then, then uh, here you are. I think yeah. Fidelity and then SBI mutual yeah. funds. It's been a great journey for you as well. So you know uh, the reason I really wanted to have this chat right now is I think we can all do with some direction and some perspective from the likes of you who are managing all of this money uh, that is taking this market higher and higher. So first things first, the fact that we've not had a meaningful correction, right? I mean, correction kya hota hai? Market falls for one day, one and a half days, and then you know you're back to making you know fresh highs. The fact that we've not had a real correction, does that worry you, sir? Um, it does, but it doesn't. Both. Asha. Right? It does because people get confused. People get keep on sitting on the sidelines. That worries me more. Mm. Because things are so exciting all across that there is money to be made. One year ago, two years ago, everybody was saying market is very high, market is heated up. But the, the uh, results and profits are also following. The PEs are still at 18, 18.5% of the future earnings for the year. So people are losing out on that. Mm. That worries me. So, but, but what we want is people must enter the market at some point of time, maybe mm. in staggered manner. Mm. That is not happening and the kind of penetration which aspired, we aspire to have is not happening. So that is something which we are worried about. When we look at the headline number exactly. of... Exactly. I'm surprised you're saying that because every month we report 17,000 crores in SIPs, 18,000 crores yeah, in January yeah, in yeah. SIPs. So that is, that is, that is correct. But uh -huh. at the same time, there's another uh, uh, lens to look at it. Uh -huh. That the overall inflows in the market uh -huh. and net inflows, if we talk about, uh -huh. are not even matching the SAP numbers. If but you you're talk about 17, X of SIP, the lump sum money that's there in the market. Yeah, yeah even lump sum money, even the SIP money is not staying back. Oh. The 17,000 crore, if we are talking about that means by now we should have 170,000 crore, 180,000 crore of net sales in because of SIP alone. Hmm. But that number is less than 160,000 uh, crores. Okay. So, so overall people are putting in money through SIPs, people are withdrawing money, they are booking profit. We are managing almost 700,000 crores of equity assets. Uh -huh. And we are managing our, our universe is around 400 companies only. Yeah. So there are so many yeah. more companies which can we can come in, which yeah. uh, our universe can go high. We can there's a lot of a place where we can make money for the investors. Oh, absolutely. So that's what we are looking for. Absolutely, and we've we've seen I mean this flurry yeah. of listings also a lot yeah. of new companies you know yes. and from new sectors, drone makers and defense sector. A lot of new companies are coming in. Uh, but Bala, when I ask you the same question, the, right. so how do you see it? Yeah. Like uh, Mr. Singh yeah. is saying that there are also redemptions. Right. Maybe it's a healthy sign that people right. are also partially booking profit and then redeploying. How do you see all this money coming in from a fund manager's perspective? Yeah. So for me, it's more about expectations. Mm -hmm. So when you think about it, right, like markets tend to do well mm -hmm. in a growing economy over time. From that perspective, the markets making new highs is a natural thing in the sense that as economies grow mm -hmm. and profitability also should grow and, and hence markets will sort of uh, hit new uh, all time highs all the time essentially. right? The problem is in terms of expectations because the last three years have been so fantastic for investors. When you think about long term expectations from equity markets, mm -hmm. it should follow profitability growth. Mm -hmm. Earnings growth should drive stock returns. Absolutely. And earnings growth should be in line with GDP with a slight multiplier effect. Mm -hmm. So, so from a long-term perspective, that is the return expectation that you should have from equities. Mm -hmm. So, what does that translate into? So, that will be like in the in the low to mid-teens range, okay. right? So, mid-teens, if you if you think you actually mm -hmm. can do a good job, kind mm -hmm. of thing. The last three years, the returns have been far north of that. Yeah. Now. Part of it is because the base was so good. Before mm. that, a lot of these stocks essentially didn't do well at all for 5-10 years. And mm. so they have essentially woken up in a hurry, so to speak. Mm. My problem is if people are just looking at the returns that they've seen over the last three years and yeah. expect that to continue going forward, mm. that will be a challenge. Mm. 
but can equity still deliver returns better than most other asset classes over any medium to longer term time frame from current mm -hmm. levels i think so mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. from that perspective we would advise people to stay invested in equity markets if they are really thinking about it from a longer term perspective sure but if they are looking at the returns that they saw last year and want <laughs> that to continue I think that is where you're essentially going to uh, see a lot of disappointment. Well, I guess that's where a little bit of education also comes in. That's where our role comes in because I think over the years, people know that you can't expect 30%, 35%. I mean, I think 15% CAGR and, and I, you know, I do a couple of personal finance shows as well. So I think people do say that if I get, as you're saying, high teens CAGR, it, it should be, it should be good. But that brings me to another issue, uh, the chase for equity, the gold rush for equity, right? We all have discovered, we as in the retail investors, we've discovered that uh, equity is probably the best asset class for long-term long wealth creation. But is that posing a challenge? Uh, when it comes to hybrid funds, when it comes to investing in debt, because debt funds anyway, they were given a huge blow, uh, you know, by the powers that be in terms of, you know, the, the tax issue. Uh, so is this a dilemma, sir? It's not a dilemma, actually. There, uh, Here comes the role of education. Here comes the role of people like you to tell me how hybrid works. Yeah. See, basically what we are trying to tell is today there's a different uh, situation is like this, that when we look at the numbers, if I look at, see, for last two years, number 21, 22, 22, 23, even this year, the total money which has come into bank deposits is more than 30 lakh crores. Mm -hmm. And in the same period, the money which has come in mutual funds is less than 4 lakh crores. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. so that's around 10, 12% of this thing. Yeah. And when we look at it, the provident funds and pensions, they have got around 8 lakh crores. Small savings have got almost similar amount of money. Yeah. So, so that has something where uh, see we are looking because people are talking about equity a lot. Mm. We thought we always think that that lot of money is chasing. Mm. Where the money which can come into equities is much much more than what it is coming today. Mm. So, mm -hmm. but for the hybrid, what you yeah. talked about because, because today, now it is apple to um, apples, right? Yeah, there is no um, tax advantage of parking that money in debt farms, which was a huge advantage earlier, yeah. and now that's been taken but, away. But you look at it in this way that the people, the first timers. Mm. They need to start their journey with the hybrids. Mm. That is utmost necessary because people who are in the lower uh, tax bracket, mm. they can start their journey with the conservative hybrid because of course there is no uh, tax advantage, mm. but at least 20% is going into equity. They, that will give kicker. Mm. They will definitely over a medium to longer period get better returns than that, yeah. though there is mm. no tax advantage. Yeah. But if you look at the second class of the hybrids where 35% and above are in equities, maybe 35% mm -hmm. in equities, mm -hmm. that is the best asset class. Because you still get the tax yeah. treatment of equity. Yeah. yeah. Uh, while you have, you know, investment uh, in other... Not equity. We, we get the, uh, the benefit of their three uh, classes now. Mm -hmm. One is debt, pure debt, yeah. where less than 35% in equity, where the marginal rate of tax will be there. Yeah. There is another asset class where more than 35% or 35% and above are in equity yeah. and remaining in debt. That is having indexation benefits still. Okay. And the third is equity. Which, which is, is equity there. tax. So okay. this the second class is yeah. the most attractive. Ah, Here okay. comes like uh, our multi asset, uh, um, uh, multiple asset class mm. of funds, multi mm. asset funds, mm. as well as uh, I mean then comes the balance advantage fund. Mm -hmm. which are also playing in the uh, in, uh, debt and equity. Yeah. So these are the best for the uh, the people who are one, who are the starting their journey now. Mm -hmm. And second, those who want to conserve their capital mm -hmm. over a medium period. Okay. They don't want to lose out the, the problem is, sir, that the person who's starting out today, maybe in his you know early 20s, first salary, is screaming, screaming micro cap fund. <laughs> I want a small cap fund, right? <laughs> That is the anomaly. That, yeah. is, that is anomaly because when, when <laughs> see, that is where the role of distribution comes. Because he's looking at the headlines, he's looking at the ticker. Yeah, and he's yeah. like, I must have a small cap fund. Yeah, right? yeah. That, that, yeah, that, yeah. That's an yeah. issue. That yeah, is yeah, where our yeah. role comes as a responsible sure. uh, uh, manufacturer sure. sure. and media and uh, other people. We, we, and see, honestly speaking, Amphi and uh, Sebi is also working a lot on this. Sure, sure, and sure. They, they have really, really worked hard on this. Bala, your thoughts on the whole yeah. gold rush for well, pure equity funds. I think what is really important is mm. each person has to really understand themselves mm. in terms of what kind of investor they are, mm. right? Now, if someone really, and, 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 and this is real introspection that you should do. If someone truly says that mm. I am investing from a 15, 20 year, 30 year perspective because I'm quite young mm. and I can easily sort of continue investing for the next 30 years. Yeah. I don't mind any correction that might come in the interim period. Yeah. And when they say that, 
they really have to mean it because mm. normally what you've seen is mm. that people say that we don't care about interim corrections mm. but when they come then they get scared <laughs> so this is where you have to do introspection and ask mm. yourself are you really in it for the next 15 20 30 year yeah. period if so equities is exactly. one of the best sort of yeah. like compounding yeah. machines out there yeah uh, no yeah. doubt yeah. about that yeah so so yeah. there then even let's assume with all this gold rush if someone wants to join it mm -hmm. i have no problems with that because okay. what we've seen is that even if someone for example, if you go back in history mm. and someone put in uh, money in beginning of 2008, mm. maybe the worst time because mm. it was just before the yeah. great financial crisis yeah. that happened, yeah. right? Yeah. Let's assume someone decided to put money in equities uh, on 1st January 2008. Mm. If that person didn't do anything yeah. and kept the money invested for the last 15 years or so, would have been a they still would have person. been okay, yeah. right? And that is the beauty of equities when you yeah. really think yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah. But the problem is, let's assume someone put money in 1st January 2008 yeah. and when markets saw such a steep correction, yeah. did they think about withdrawing money in December 2008? Mm. That is the worst That's problem. The problem. That's that is the problem. The is so this is where people have to ask themselves, mm -hmm. Will I get scared if I see a 20% mm -hmm. drawdown? Because but but yeah. hasn't sorry sorry you know coming yeah. in this. But don't you think that's kind of changed after COVID? Because see what's happening in the market today. Mm. The moment there is like a 500 point drop or a thousand point correction, uh, typically people sort of know that okay this is a good time to deploy. Like like Mr. Singh is saying yeah. that everybody is waiting for the right. correction. Right. So maybe to an extent uh, this this is changing and investors have gotten more mature. Would you say? No, but uh, the way I think about it is if you mm -hmm. look at the period from 2003 to 2007 end you had small corrections, mm. but they were uh, short-lived. Mm. When you talk about corrections, the key is whether it's short-lived or not. Yeah. People can easily digest mm. sharp corrections if it's short-lived. Yeah, yeah, the last true. three years, okay. we haven't really seen any deep, long-lasting correction. That is true. Even COVID uh, was a V. Uh, yeah, was, COVID, yeah, like yeah. COVID, in fact, further solidified the, the thought process that it will be short-lived. Yeah. But if yeah. you look at the long history, that is not necessarily the case. That's so, so uh, very true. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is where people just need to be prepared for that. Yeah. Yeah. And that is where we say that if someone is going to be worried hmm. with a 20% long-drawn correction, hmm. then we would recommend asset allocation funds. Because yeah. what asset allocation funds do is they reduce the drawdown. Hmm. It makes you inherently more comfortable, where you say, okay, there is some capital erosion, but it's not so stark, hmm. and I can ride it out. Yeah. And, and so for people who are more sensitive to corrections, we would always recommend an asset allocation fund. Within that, as uh, DP sir mentioned, we have a whole gamut of uh, different types of uh, hybrid funds. Sure, sure. Uh, but, that, but that is something we will re definitely recommend for a lot of risk sensitive yeah. Uh, preserve the downside basically uh, which right now nobody's thinking of nobody's thinking of downside yeah. that's the problem yeah. which also brings me to the the fund management philosophy bala and just expand on that a little bit yeah. because you know typically fund managers are either growth oriented or value oriented yeah. But we are in a market where value stocks have become growth stocks and traditional growth stocks, which are like, you know, FMCG, et cetera, they haven't performed, mm. you know, and HDFC bank is, is sulking. So the market's kind of turned on its head, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. What I'll say is this, right? Um, this is where I will probably tom tom SBI mutual fund a bit <laughs> because uh, I genuinely uh, feel this way. When I think about different AMCs, normally they have a certain defined investing philosophy. Right, be it growth oriented or be it value oriented, uh, you know, people pick their spots. Yeah. When you look at our organization, it actually allows multiple investing styles to flourish. Um, and we can actually see this because I tend to be much more value conscious. When I say yeah. value conscious, what do I really mean? It means that I give greater emphasis to valuations. Okay. For me, valuations matter. So even if there's a great company out there doing fantastic things, mm -hmm. If it is so well discovered and, and the valuations are very expensive, I'll stay away from investing in that company, okay. right? Now, someone else, uh, like within, even within my organization, uh, Vasan, who is our CIO, he is probably more growth oriented. So he will essentially say that, you know what, in this whole tussle between valuations and growth, expected growth, mm. I'm going to err towards higher growth companies. Okay. Uh, and, we, and we coexist. And, and, and so it's, it's actually something uh, pretty good that, that you have a growth style of investing. Mm -hmm. You have a value style of investing. Mm -hmm. You have someone who focuses a lot on promoter quality and so on. Mm -hmm. So that is something where we have a mix of different styles within the fund house. Mm -hmm. Now, with regards to value doing particularly well, over the yeah. last year or two. When value it? stocks rise 300%, then what do they become? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes this is where this whole uh, distinction between value style and growth style sometimes it's a bit superficial and artificial mm. in the sense that all of us what are we trying to do we are trying to find the highest possible growth at the lowest possible valuation mm. 
with the best possible management quality. So the three okay. pillars when you okay. think about okay. it, exactly, right? <laughs> it's basically management quality is about business model and growth and valuations. Yeah. And in an idea scenario, you want the best of all three parameters. But yeah. clearly that is not going to happen. Yeah. 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 So then within that, you are trying to optimize where you say that, okay, you know what, I'm going to sacrifice a bit on the growth front to hmm. get a better margin of safety from a valuations perspective, or someone will sort of do something else. Hmm. So we're all trying to optimize. Got so it. this this labeling of stocks as value stocks or as growth stocks also is artificial. We need to be more nuanced. Yeah, perhaps, in the sense that a, yeah. a, a particular sector might yeah. be going through a tough time mm -hmm. where it is not showing earnings growth and, mm -hmm. and this can last for even five, seven, ten years. Yeah. That doesn't mean that that sector will never grow going forward. Yeah, yeah. This is what allows for fantastic opportunities. If you look at the power space, which we yeah. spoke about, power sector didn't show earnings growth for the last seven, 10 years mm. because there was an overcapacity issue. Mm. But in a growing country like India, eventually demand goes up enough that that overcapacity gets utilized. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, you're going to see a huge need for new projects to come into place. Which is what is happening now. And so automatically then the yeah. earnings growth picks up for yeah. companies in this sector. Okay, so let me ask you this, since you've traditionally been a value conscious you know, yeah. stock picker, uh, hmm. industrials, uh, defense, PSUs, yep. if, if you take them one by one just very quickly, yep. which ones do you think have now ceased to be value and which yep. ones do you think you know, still yeah. offer, or yeah. offer some, something? So in my opinion, a lot of these sectors actually still have enough earnings tailwinds. Okay. that I think that there can still be good earnings growth going forward. So even if I don't believe in further valuation re-rating, mm -hmm. I can still expect good returns. So for me, power, uh, uh, energy, now this is, I'm not saying this because we just launched this energy fund. In fact, we launched this energy fund because we are convinced of this theme, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, we think stocks in these sectors have enough earning tail, uh, tailwind mm -hmm. that we can still sort of expect sort of good returns from here on. Okay. Having said that, Frankly speaking, when I think about the defense team, it's a fantastic team uh, 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 where you have nice uh, tailwinds uh, in play. But there, I am struggling with valuations. So someone who cares more about valuations, mm -hmm. for me, I'm struggling to understand why do I pay so much? Mm -hmm. I, uh, that's where I say, uh, there can be great companies doing good things. Mm -hmm. But if there isn't valuation comfort, I will stay away. So for me, a lot of the companies in the defense team, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on whether you are invested yeah. early on or not, uh, have done so well mm. that the valuations have value gone up so is, much that there is very yeah. little margin of safety left. And, and uh, what about railway? Every day railway yeah. stocks, so 20%, railway, 20%. Again, <laughs> railways, like many of the railways companies, frankly speaking, I struggle to understand. How, how does someone justify the valuations of these companies? Yeah. Yeah. So those, those are, I mean, the, the challenges that perhaps you know, we work with and we leave all the discretion to, of course, the fund managers like you to, to handle that. Yeah. That's a lot of the technical talk, but I, I want to come back down to the basics and I want to, you know, take your, your sort of cue and your tip on making money and growing money from here on, given the environment that we're in. So, Mr. Singh, you tell us, what do you do for your money or, you know, what do you advise people in the family and, and what's the strategy that you'd like to put out on the table? No, honestly speaking, uh, whenever it happens in, the, in the, uh, the family circle or something, I always tell them, the people who have not yet invested, I, uh, I always tell them to start uh, investing in multi-asset, that's a no-brainer. Okay. Actually, the people who retire also, who don't have time, we have to yet to decide. Mm. Say, uh, at least park in multi-asset, then we'll decide. Okay. Put in money. So that that's one thing because okay. equity has to be there in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. But taking some clues, what you are when you were talking to to Bala on the on the growth and value and this thing. The honestly speaking, today I mean we are proud of the investment team. That not investing in the stocks is more much better, a much more difficult decision than investing somewhere. Okay. So they 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 are actually doing a lot of we are not to be there. Mm. So that is something which is very important because. No growth, no value, but what we are talking about is the investor. Yeah. Investor centricity is, is, is very, very important and that is very much there. Yeah. And sometimes we, we are, some funds are doing underperforming, right? Mm -hmm. But we are proud of that underperformance because our emphasis on the restricting the drawdown when, when the markets go down, that, that should be there. So that, that's, that's something which is there. But uh, the tip is, uh, see, another point uh, which I want to discuss is uh, when, when we are saying the corrections are not happening, the people who are sitting on the sidelines, yeah. actually their behavior has been so, so mature. Whenever there is a correction, yeah. a mild correction, we see the inflows, but exactly. they are coming, coming yeah. in a staggered manner. Yeah. The day market is down by say 2% to 2.5%, we get a lot of inflows in the market. Mm. But people, 
are sitting with the say they are sitting with the 100,000. Yeah. So they will put 20,000 on the correction <laughs> day. But they look for another 20. Then again they don't get. <laughs> As you rightly said, the market next day goes up. Yeah. So they again yeah, yeah. keep on sitting on yeah. the sidelines. Yeah. So the number of uh, real investors mm. need to increase because that's what we feel. Mm. Uh, because of so many other uh, things in the ecosystem mm. like proper distribution system the uh, the what what we feel is that that the people at the lower uh, the lowest level of the pyramid or the mm. mid level of pyramid are not being serviced uh, mm. properly because of the overall uh, see remunerative model which is there in the market okay. we need to work on that i think okay. from mutual fund industry point of view mm. if that is taken care of i think the industry can grow much much faster because today mm. it is growing fast yeah. but the most of the growth is coming because of the market to market gains Mm. This is mm. M2M gains rather than the inflows. We need to get more people yeah, to come get into more the people. Fold. The net yeah. flows have to grow. Mark to market gain will will showcase like I mean, that's a function to, of the market. Just yeah. to give you an example, when when today are 52 lakh crores uh, from 40 lakh crores, uh, I mean almost nine nine and a half lakh crores has come out of the mark to market. Got it. Only two two and a half lakh crores has come through the flow. Money that's, that's so so the, generally it gives headline impression <laughs> that a lot of money is flowing in, which is not correct. Got it, got it. I think we have to you know keep that caveat in mind while mm -hmm. we're looking at the numbers and celebrating them. Um, Bala, we're coming down to the last uh, you know one or two minutes of the show. So give give us a wealth tip, a money tip, maybe a sector tip. And you, you're a techie, right? You you spoke about you know what you were studying in in your science class and uh, energy transition. You know the search for a new kind of more powerful batteries. That's really the buzz. Yeah. Um, so, give us the tip and also give us a context to this sector because typically, you know, the gold rush starts here and everything, you know, is painted with the same brush and that's why mistakes are also made. Right. So when we're talking, uh, you know, hard, you know, cutting edge science, especially on the green transition, yep. what is it that you're looking out for? Yeah. Frankly speaking, um, in the Indian landscape. Uh, things are still in a very nascent stage mm. on the green energy or any of these energy yeah. transition yeah. technologies yeah. Uh, front, right? Yeah. Um, what the, I always remember this quote from uh, one of my uh, seniors while I was at Fidelity that when you think about the great California gold rush, mm. uh, you know, a lot of people flock to California to, to look for gold. Begging for gold. The only guys who ended up making money are the guys who sold shovels to them. <laughs> because like people spent so much money trying to dig gold and they really didn't get much. So the only smart guys were the guys selling, you know, shovel and such yeah. equipment to, to uh -huh. these uh, miners, right? So just because a theme is great mm. doesn't mean that you go out and buy any and all companies associated with And every IPO that. that's coming with the green, yeah. green Yeah, yeah. because that is in, in fact the greatest sort of recipe for disaster. Yeah. Uh, that just because someone has a tag, you go out yeah. and buy that company, yeah. right? Yeah. You really have to dig deep. Mm. and find out which companies have inherent some competitive advantage yeah. that is going to allow them to stay put. Mm. Uh, because with any emerging technology, mm -hmm. you're always going to have booms and busts. Sure. Uh, uh, so, so for us, the hard work is really trying to dig deep yeah. and figure out which among these companies yeah. have some competitive advantages. And when can we buy them with a margin of safety? Uh, Correct. Uh, Correct. So while I feel excited about mm -hmm. this whole energy transition aspect, mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. think down the line, we are going to find a lot more companies mm -hmm. uh, as potential investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. We also need to be mindful that just because a theme looks good, don't go out and you know buy any and all companies. You know, on, that. On, on that, let me ask you, are you someone who is comfortable buying uh, loss-making companies, even if they're in a great sector yeah. and seem to have a wide market potential yes. ahead of them? Yeah, I'm perfectly okay. Okay. Because to me, loss-making, uh, on year, in year one mm -hmm. is completely okay. Mm. As long as you're, you're convinced that the profit making ability in year 10 is going yeah. to be extremely high. Think so about the path, Amazon. The path to profitability. Yeah, that you we have to about. be convinced yeah. that there is a viable business model. Yeah. Uh, that is a key. So, so yeah. I'm perfectly okay. Okay, and, and then your wealth tips. So, you know, yeah. wealth tips slash a sector that, and, I, and I'm asking for a three year perspective, right. not like immediately. Right. What are the must have sectors in your portfolio or the must do in your portfolio yeah. from that perspective? The way I think about it, mm -hmm. India is only now beginning to accelerate mm -hmm. from a GDP growth perspective. Mm -hmm. so the last decade, we've been stuck in a very narrow range, mm -hmm. right? And now that is beginning to change. So when I think about a lot of the cyclical sectors, think about real estate, think about uh, energy, think about uh, sectors associated with real estate, okay. uh, you know, supplying material mm -hmm. to, to real estate projects yeah. and stuff yeah. like that, right? Uh, uh, those kind of sectors inherently still make a lot of sense. Okay. Now, these these are not like undiscovered gems at this point because yeah. the market also <laughs> has embraced this theme, right? Yes. But where, from a staying power perspective, okay. uh, I feel a lot of the cyclical sectors mm. still have enough sort of tailwinds 
uh, that one can still make good money from a three to five year perspective. So power, real uh, estate. Uh, where you think about the ancillary real mm -hmm. estate uh, ancillary sectors, so okay. cement, ma building materials, you know, all those okay. segments essentially. Got it. We'll keep that in mind. Mm. So let's end by getting your three year vision, sir, as well for. Uh, for the, the mutual fund industry as a whole, because it has come a long way. I mean, retail participation has increased. Your point on flows is well taken. There's this whole you know rush for passives. Passives for SBI also are a pretty big uh, sort of part of your AUM. Three years, what can investors look out for from the mutual fund sector? See, I think industry should grow from here on at least 2x of the GDP growth okay. at the industry level. Mm -hmm. And 3x of GDP growth for SBI mutual fund. Okay. That is, wow. that is that is something which, 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 which tall targets. Which, yeah, 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 yeah. But but that is that is absolutely doable mm -hmm. because we have lots and lots of journey uh, yet to finish. We are okay. not even middle. Yeah. We are not in middle as of now. Mm -hmm. We have to reach out. Though we are trying to reach out to every nook and corner of the country and every kind of investor. Yeah. yeah. But but uh, one thing is there: the ecosystem is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And the people are ready to take risk. Mm -hmm. Only thing is our our responsibility to keep on educating them what they should uh, they, uh, be looking at, as Bala said. You the mid-teens uh, <laughs> kind of returns is, is, is good enough. And mm. that's, that's what, from my point of view. And you, you ducked the question on passives. The whole active versus passive, and whether passives will overtake and start overshadowing you know, active management down the line. You know, see, there's enough money to be made in passives as mm. well as enough money to be made in actives. So active, there's a lot of alpha can be generated and the role of fund manager is going to be extremely important. Mm -hmm. But within passives, there are so many smart beta strategies which are which are not hardcore passives mm -hmm. and not hardcore actives. In between, though those will come under the definition of passives only, okay. like we had this equal weight mm -hmm. or, or the momentum 30 mm -hmm. out of 200, these kind of uh, strategies are there. But, but there is a definitely appetite for passives passive will continue to grow at the same percentage or little more uh, higher growth and uh, on the but the base level being being lower mm -hmm. it will take some time to uh, for passives to to overtake the actives but actives and passives will coexist in a big yeah. way in india at least for the next one decade Okay, all right. So that's sort of a look ahead to the industry at large, to what investors can do. It's been fantastic speaking to both of you gentlemen. Very, very insightful. Thank you so much. And I hope we'll see more of you all as the year progresses as well. Yeah. But many thanks for being with us today. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. That's a wrap on this edition of Market Cafe. See you with another conversation soon. Thank you for watching CNBC TV 18 and do follow us on all our social media platforms for news, updates and more.